Well, it's uh, oh, a thirty-five. We're, we're uh, going overtime here on the beginning, so uh, I guess we should begin. Welcome to the uh, April Imaging Sig meeting, the first of many, hopefully, that will be an online web conference style imaging sig meeting and um although i do hope that we can meet together in person soon um, at least getting somebody to uh, present this way is, is very attractive because we can get presenters from very far away and not have to have them travel um, so I, I think this is very promising for for our group to, to get presenters uh, we already have a couple lined up gary lopez is probably uh, he's going to be joining us next month. And uh, um, anyway, um, we uh, are going to have an open discussion tonight and talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. If you want to show us some of your recent images or talk about projects you've been doing, um, please feel free. And uh, Glenn uh, was going to he was going to talk about he is going to talk about his experience uh, with 3D printing and how it's been helping him in the hobby. And I, I can say from experience, it's been helping me in the hobby too. As a matter of fact, I'm uh, on the verge of getting a 3D printer myself because it has been so helpful to uh, make various things that, that we need. And um, it's amazing that you can just make it in your house now instead of getting it from precise parts and uh, you know putting an order in and getting it a month later maybe. So, uh, Glenn, you want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, I can do that. Um, okay. Let me share a window here. And hi, I think you're presenting. We cannot hear you. Hi. You're on mute. We can see you. Uh, oh. my, so my hack doesn't work, huh? <laughs> Okay. Oh, wow. What happened to the background? I can see your house. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> can you guys see my uh, not, Word document not, here? Yes, we can see. We okay. can see your, uh, yep. your list. Fantastic. Okay. So um, I didn't, didn't make a whole PowerPoint or anything. Bruce just told me about this this afternoon, but I did make a list of things that I have 3D printed that were for astro imaging. So uh, one of the latest things was uh, just lens caps or dust covers. Uh, so when I've got parts of scopes exposed or um, I am using a, a camera lens right at the moment and uh, just with that, a little 50 millimeter Orion guide scope to do the guiding and uh, somehow I lost the the dust cover for that or the lens cap for that. So when I went to do, uh, you know, a new profile in PhD2, I didn't have anything to cover the 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 uh, lens with. But, you know, 20 minutes later, uh, I had a 3D printed cap that fit right on it. So that's cool. And of course, lots of threaded adapters slash spacers for people and myself using these different threads listed here are some of the ones I've done. Um, and Paulo is is uh, working on improving the, th the thread library that we're using and also on figuring out how to get the threads right the first time versus having to print, you know, four or five different versions to account for the material expansion and whatnot. Um, then I've done, you know, some some just essentially washers, uh, uh, and uh, did this adapter for for Bruce to help get his uh, his camera adapter centered in his Raza 11 inch, and that's still a work in progress, I guess. Um, you know, mounting hardware, uh, lots of stuff for camera lenses and mounting and focusing that stuff. Um, things that connect to the back of your camera and form a, a, a strain relief. And this was important as part of my uh, 
DIY rotator project so that all the wires came off in one place and kind of the center of things and so that the whole thing could rotate and not get get hung up on the wires. Um, yeah, and then what are called follow focus gears. Right now I have, I guess that's something else I could talk about tonight is now I have a an adapter for Canon lens that uses the motors inside the lens to focus. But before that, I had kind of a semi DIY uh, rig where we had gears and, and uh, stepper motors to move the body of the lens. Uh, and so those were all 3D printed and uh, made some three, two inch filter storage boxes for Bruce, right? And uh, because he's for the Raza, you know, he's not going to have a, a filter uh, rotator. He's going to have a, a tray that he puts in one, one at a time. So we need something to store those in. Apollo uh, designed a really cool uh, focuser for off-axis guiders. And uh, so I've got one of those and he's got one. We both have the same off-axis guider. Um, filter wrenches, and then for my DIY rotator pr project, there was a bunch of stuff, the the gears and belts and, and the project box and the stepper motor mount. Uh, I mounted my solar scene scintillation monitor with 3D printed stuff. And uh, can you see all the way to the bottom here, the materials? That was, can you see the materials where I am on the screen here, somebody? Yes, yes we can. Yeah, yes, okay. we can. So uh, nylon carbon fiber is what I started with for the astronomy parts. Um, and that's good, um, except it's got kind of a rough finish. And so now Paulo and I have been moving on to uh, ASA. It's a different type of plastic. It's also good for outdoors and it has a smooth finish. So we think it might be better for, for finer threads. Uh, and then some of the flexible parts that need to flex or stretch, I made out of a material called TPU. And that can be either uh, translucent like Bruce's, uh, I guess Bruce's uh, filter box is actually made out of PLA, which I didn't list here, but uh, anyway, the, the TPU can be either uh, translucent or colored. Um, so just some of the stuff that that I've done. And then I think when I first presented on, on 3D printing and Astro many moons ago, uh, in the PowerPoint I did for that, there were lots of examples of designs of things, including whole telescopes that you could download and and 3D print. So usually I don't design everything from scratch. I'll just go to Thingiverse and search for, you know, whatever, uh, a lens cap or something, and then tweak it from there. So that's the th Glenn, 3D printing. Yeah. One, one question. And then maybe you said, what, what printer are you using for this? Oh, let me. Uh, stop sharing for a second maybe you can see my screen if i do, i mean my camera if i do that i, I, uh, I, I can actually see it is it behind you well i have two now um so this one that i'm pointing at is the first one i got and that's a you know has an enclosure and that's good for the the carbon fiber uh it needs to be higher temperature and it needs to be enclosed yeah. and the material actually spool is inside that enclosure as well and then i can't see my camera uh but if i turn it a little bit over here uh, apollo and i both have this uh fl sun uh qq-s delta printer and uh, we're using that for the asa uh and some of the other materials and it's a little faster uh, and it's you know a different style of printer, but it it uh, has its has its advantages and disadvantages. Okay. Okay. Trying to put my camera back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I have a MakerBot 
replicator. And boy, that uh -huh. thing is not good for anything serious. <laughs> It's good for toys, but any better material or something because it doesn't have a heated bed or anything. Oh it's, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah, yeah. So the 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 FL Sun QQ S uh, is not going to do like the the nylon and even the I think for the ASA Apollo is like enclosed. His uh, I'm still doing it uh, unenclosed, but. Um, it's fairly versatile that way. And then the, the QIDI X Max uh, can do pretty much everything. Um, you know, it can, it can, because it, they actually have, they give you two extruders, uh, two hot ends, uh, one for higher temperature stuff and one for lower temperature stuff. So that's one reason why I have two printers is I have the QI, uh, QIDI set up just for the carbon fiber, the high temperature, and then the other one I use for for the lower temperature materials. So you said uh, Paolo uh, is uh, enclosing his because of the ASA. Is that because of the like the uh, strong smell when you're using ASA versus the other stuff, or? Well, ASA is is not as strong smelling as as some of the other like ABS or something, but it does have some odor. Mm -hmm. But the uh, a ABS in particular and and ASA is much better. But ABS is hard to print because it it um, warps really easy if you don't have uh, a constant temperature enclosure. So mm -hmm. um, that's. Would be, it'd be really hard to print ABS without an enclosure, um, and to a certain extent, I guess the ASA. But I've been doing all right with without the enclosure for the ASA. But I might not be printing as big of things as as uh, Paulo is. I don't know. Okay. Hmm. Um, um, oh, sorry. I was going to ask: okay. Are there any? Uh, concerns about the longevity of like the threads or the strength of that stuff it seems like you know that they're pretty fine parts and you know is it the kind of thing that you thread it in once and never worry about it or if you're taking it out maybe it, it breaks or anything so most of the things that i've done as threaded adapters have been prototypes so it's like you you need something and so you print it up and use it while you're waiting for the metal part to to arrive um I know, uh, I think uh, Apollo, you know, I made him a, a adapter that goes from his short tube 80 all the way down to his, his guide scope. And I think he's had that outside for, for quite a while. Um, but, you know, there's bits and pieces of, of uh, not threaded adapters, but, you know, my whole rotator and, and stuff has been outside for months now uh, and it's been fine. Um, so yeah, I guess you know, kind of use at your own risk kind of thing. But but you know, we keep learning about more about the materials and and uh, making sure that they're UV resistant and and all of that stuff. So I, I think it's probably just a good idea. Like anytime, one of the one of the first tips I learned about astrophotography uh, from from the Orion store, believe it or not was uh, uh, you know when you when you put hook your camera to a telescope, you know flip the the shoulder strap up over the the uh, guide scope or something so that if if something does come loose, you know at least your camera doesn't hit the ground. And I think if I was, and I'm probably giving Bruce this advice, you know, yeah, here's this adapter you asked me to make for your multi thousand dollar CCD camera, right? So, put some string or something just in case this thing dissolves in an instant or something, you know, just in case. Yeah. So that, that would be the, the, just an extra safety uh, measure, I guess. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know you and Paolo actually have been talking about injecting hot glue into holes that you're drilling in these things. And I guess they have tracks inside the way that it's laid so that the hot glue can actually, or epoxy can, get injected and push through the entire object and come out the other end and 
make yeah, it well, this is this is about how to make things stronger without printing them stronger because you know you can print them completely solid or you can print them with with uh, what's called infill that could be you know anywhere from five percent to to solid um, but that takes a long time so uh, people have been experimenting with injecting some kind of plastic in, inside the 3d printed part to make it stronger so two candidates are are hot glue and uh, epoxy um, and the hot glue is is a cheap material cheaper than the 3d uh, filament um, so that was something we were experimenting with but I, I wouldn't say it's successful yet this is a part here that I had to drill multiple holes in uh, it's a lens filter a uh, filter wrench uh, and I tried to get the hot glue in there and it, it didn't you know it works for a while but then the glue cools off so we're still trying to figure that out but yeah that's a work in process okay yep uh, um, I can screen share and show you guys a little bit of uh, what I used uh, how I use something that Glenn made me recently. Um, so hold on a second. Uh, I, I started this thread on cloudy nights. Um, it was based on a thread that was done by another guy who goes by the candle AP shooter. And, um, he's a Raza owner. He owns a Raza eight and, uh, he and, and other people that have Razas have noticed that, the, uh, the Raza has a collar that you use to lock down um, the camera. Maybe I should show you guys that. Uh, let's see, where is my, there we go. Okay, so, <clears throat> now I have a picture of that somewhere, okay. So the Raza has this threaded collar and uh, And it goes over the uh, the plate um, that is attached to your extensions that are attached to your camera. Up against the, the back. And they go on the front of the uh, Raza. And basically, it attaches the, uh, the plate that holds everything, including the camera, to the front of the Raza. Uh, the Raza, unlike most telescopes, it's, it's similar to a hyperstar. Your camera goes on the front. Um, and it makes it an extremely fast setup. Um, but, uh, when you're, you're tightening down this threaded collar, um, there's a lot of play and the, uh, the plate can move down left and right depend actually the, the stock plate, which has some drawbacks, um, doesn't move quite as much as the aftermarket plate that Im improves on some things a lot, but also, uh, it's a little bit thinner. Um, compared to, here's a stock plate, and here is the uh, the Botter made. Uh, hey, UFC are plate. you sharing something? I'm sorry. Are you sharing? Oh yeah, I'm sharing my. I'm sharing. Okay, my, I don't you're not Does anybody seeing? else see it? Uh, yeah, actually, I think I'm sorry. I'm seeing a lot of you. Actually, I'm seeing a hall of mirrors of you. <laughs> um, there we go. So shared. Can't share your screen. I'm having a screen sharing problem. Um, maybe it might have to do with uh, the other thing that I was sharing was not on Chrome. Can you guys see me now? Here, let me present again. Are, are you presenting? Yeah, I hit present. Did you click present now? I did click present now. No, we only um, see you, which is nice. But... Yeah, we still see your face. How about now? Oh, there oh, we go. Yep. Now it looks like it switched over. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. Um, this is the stock uh, adapter plate that you, uh, it's threaded on one side. Um, it, it threads down onto the front of a Raza, onto this uh, this thing right here, which contains some corrector lenses, and um, it flattens things out. 
like a, a Schmidt camera. Uh, if you're familiar with Schmidt cameras, they're extremely fast. I think they they made them back in the 70s. The only problem was that they required a curved piece of film inside the camera in order to, to work. And the rosin was designed so that it could be similar to a Hyperstar, extremely fast. It has the camera on the front uh, rather than at the back of the telescope. Uh, and uh, the the design of the, the Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph uh, has these lenses in the center that uh, flatten things out and uh, and basically you attach your camera uh, using a threaded collar to uh, to this device uh, at the front of the at the front of the uh, telescope. So the the stock plate uh, looks like this. And uh, I don't know why I did that. Um, so the stock plate looks like this. Um, you can get an aftermarket plate that uh, is supposed to decrease tilt and uh, it, uh, it uses extensions that are uh, held in by grub screws uh, and dovetails. Uh, so it basically allows you to get the uh, the camera to the front of the telescope distance down to uh, you know extremely narrow margin, and it keeps it solid and it keeps it uh, perpendicular and um, keeps you from having tilt. But this plate that I'm measuring here with my micrometer with my calipers, uh, unfortunately, uh, is a little bit thinner than the stock plate, and because of that difference um, because of that as you uh, thread this collar onto it it actually can move around I know I have a video of me doing that but um, I'm not sure which one it is but anyway basically um, wait a sec I think it's this one nope it's not I should have found it earlier sorry guys so um, Anyway, uh, the, the thing is that um, as you're screwing it down, um, the camera can move up, down, left, and right. And uh, there's no way that you can really uh, tighten down that collar and hit the same spot every time and keep the camera centered. Um, you're basically, uh, you know, you can try and guide it in there just by, by looking around it, but it's not very precise, and if the camera's not in the sweet spot, particularly if your camera has a large um, sector, you're gonna have more vignetting, you're gonna have uh, maybe some exaggerated tilt on the edge of your uh, your sensor. And, um, and Glenn was able to 3D print a, uh, a ring that, that goes into this threaded collar. Uh, looks something like that. Goes inside here and uh, allows you to basically guide in the, uh, uh, the, the camera plate, the adapter plate, as you screw down that, uh, that uh, collar there, the threaded collar. And so when I started actually, uh, initially I was, I was seeing a, a problem like this. I was seeing tilt on one side and uh, it was pretty flat on the rest. Um, Part of that is due to the camera distance, but also part of it was due to the camera not being centered. And um, we were able to scale up a, uh, a ring that they had designed for the Raza 8 and use it on my Raza 11. And so Glenn was able to print it up for me and I was able to, every time I put the camera in there, as you thread down that collar, you, you feel that it, it's really centering. It's not, it doesn't have any slop around it and uh, it flattened things out a lot. And I still have a lot of tweaking to do, but um, I'm really happy with the way that it worked. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've had him uh, make me some other adapters and Paolo made me a nice adapter recently. So basically what I'm saying is uh, the uh, 3D printer is an amazing tool for astrophotographers. Um, so, uh, anybody have any images they want to share or any projects that you guys have been working on lately? Anything else? I know PJ, you've, you've got some new images. Uh, well, um, actually I've had the usual run of the mill 
cable issues. And uh, I have been using the Vodge 11 for uh, several years now. And uh, I have encountered some problems with the telescope, which are similar to what Bruce is going through, but uh, they're also different. I also have somewhat of a different take on the uh, issues uh, with the Vasa. The retaining ring that um, Bruce talks about to uh, tighten down is called a lock collar. And it's about four inches diameter and it screws down onto the rotor and it requires a fair amount of torque to hold the uh, camera in place the uh, difficulty with that is is that if it's not tight enough the entire assembly will sag resulting in a in a uh, very obvious tilt of the entire focal plane <clears throat> If you tighten it up too much, and it has happened to me, the lock collar can call against the um, the roll corrector, necessitating a trip down to Torrance, California, where they could they could take the part, recalibrate the entire telescope, and um, send it back to me on their dime. Um, I have come up with a design that instead of a lock collar having to torque down on a roll corrector in order to hold the camera assembly in place, thus putting a severe amount of torque on a uh, something that is not engineered to handle it, such that the whole, whole roll corrector can spin inside the Schmidt plate, which is probably not a good thing. Uh, I have figured out a way to put, instead of lock collar compressing, I'm going to be able to put lock collar in tension. And it will require much less torque to uh, do that and to hold the uh, camera assembly very rudely against, in tension against the lock collar. So it won't be a lock collar, it'll be a tension ring. So I'm trying to figure out how to get this made. It has to be out of metal. Um, a uh, plastic won't, won't, won't uh, be able to uh, handle the stresses. But um, I, I may just uh, see if anybody at Precise Parts can, uh, can actually look at what I want to do and see if they can make it. It's not quite fits within their uh, computer-rated design um, parameters that they have on their website. So it's going to be a little bit more custom to pull this off. That being said, uh, I think that's a solution in conjunction with what Glenn and uh, Bruce are doing. Uh, what they have done is create a centering ring, which will help center the camera on there. I'm concerned about sag in the entire optical path as uh, as an issue. However, I've been using a QHY168C uh, camera, color camera, and uh, I have come to the conclusion that it is unsuitable to be used with the Vasa. Why the Vasa and the camera? is that the Vasa is very has a, um, a cone of about, I calculated out about 26 degrees angle coming in. Now the uh, advertising material for the camera uh, shows that they, they say it's fully multi-coated. If you read the fine print on the Sony chip that the camera uses, the uh, cover plate directly over the sensors comes with the Sony sensor is not anti-reflective coating. So what that means is that when you have very steep uh, angle coming in, the light goes out, goes inside the um, 
the second chamber. It's the sensor that light now becomes a uh, principle of Huygens becomes a light source. It now reflects off the back of the cover glass right in front of the sensor and reflects back to the sensor, thereby creating a halo that in any kind of medium bright star is about 90 pixels in diameter. It is pervasive, it happens every time. It is very obvious that when you see a globe, when, when you, um, if you try and, and uh, pixel size, you see these stars that are just globes. Uh, I actually came up, uh, derived an equation that will calculate how wide this globe is depending on the F number. It's only dependent on the F number. So that, that um, that equation also showed me that if I were to use use camera on about a f4.5 five uh, optical system, it should work great. So that is what I'm doing now. I've retired. I have uh, sent the the Vaza to the bench, and I have uh, resurrected my six inch Newtonian astrograph, which I built about eight years ago. And so that, what I'm doing is getting that all fired up to do it. Uh, so uh, it is very cheap to build, and it's just a Newtonian six inch, but uh, already the test shots show that I do not have a discernible halo. I have to look really close to show that it's uh, that the very minute halo does pretty well match my calculation and how big it would be. So I was actually able to calculate the, the space between the sensor and the cover glass on the sensor itself using the geometry. I used to be a surveyor. So uh, your cosines and tangents and all that good stuff come in handy on that kind of thing. So that's where I'm at now. I have the QHY 160. AC attached to a six Newtonian, which is on a uh, <laughs> MX plus mount. Uh, so uh, I've been having fun, you know, dialing that telescope in. I'm ready to give it a full moon to later on as this meeting progresses. Any questions? Um, uh, I was going to say at some point I tried to get Ashley to make me something that was not in his uh, web configurator, and he steadfastly refused to do it. So hmm. precise parts might not want to make anything unless it can be generated on their website. So it's unfortunate, but well, it is. is there machinists in the house? You know, actually. Um, I uh, ran across a machinist. I think it's Michael's machinist's shop in San Jose. And uh, I had a, a, a serious 11 pound weight, uh, weight that I wanted to use with my Atlas Pro. And it needed to be bored out a little bit. And uh, he uh, was more than happy to help me out. As a matter of fact, he insisted not to, to bill me for any of the work. He, he would not take money. Um, he did want me to send people in his direction. So I highly recommend him. And um, he seemed very willing to, to uh, do something custom. So he's local and uh, a very nice guy. So you could at least uh, like a, give him a call. That's a really good resource. Uh -huh. uh, of course, uh, I'm actually 150 miles away uh -huh. up by Yosemite for what i Hanging out the last six weeks, um, avoiding the COVID thing because I'm one of those uh, patients that don't want to get it very dependent. So what I what I hear Bruce saying is is um, the deal is Bruce gets stuff for free and the rest of us pay. <laughs> Do I have that right? <laughs> Nothing new there, I guess. <laughs> Sounds like a pyramid scheme to me. <laughs> No, I would actually be great if you could pass it around, Bruce, because I still need an adapter to put my 10 micron mounts on my um, Astrophysics Eagle here. 
and I could never figure it out. It, it's it's not that difficult to make. It doesn't need to be super precise. It's just a solid block of steel or of metal that you basically need. And then I could never find a way how to do this myself. You definitely can't 3D print it. So having something like this would be awesome here locally. I'll look his number up. Cool, thank you. Sure, no problem. And I will tell him that you sent me. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to mention, it's not that I dislike you guys, but I have this mouse dyslexia where wherever I want to mute myself, I hit the a hang up button instead. So forgive me for that. One. No problem. <laughs> um, I'm going to have to look for it. But um, hi, do you have any images you wanted to share? Or Glenn, I know you you had some uh, stuff that you did recently. I actually had something uh, for hi. Ah, what's that? Uh, well, let me uh, attempt me. to. Because I liked your green image and nobody else did, is that it? Uh, because you commented on the 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 star, the halos that were coming from stars just outside of my crop. Uh, I think this uh, is right. I remember sure. that. I was saying that you. I, I meant what exactly you said, which was that you. When I said crop, I didn't mean crop. With Photoshop, I meant yeah, by moving your telescope. Are you guys seeing uh, Photoshop? No, black screen. Yeah, black no screen. Black. Okay, I might not be able to. It said uh, Nvidia overlay. Let me try again here and see if I can get it to. I might have to pick the screen versus a window. Let me try this. How does it know which screen? Okay. How about now? It's starting. Yes. Yep. There you go. OK, so uh, this image, uh, this is just uh, the, the HA stack. It's not a finished image. Uh, and you see here this uh, up at the top, there's a, a bright star that's just outside of the crop. But I didn't want to crop out this nebulosity. Uh, and then there's also one just outside the bottom here. It's a little harder to see, but uh, and so um, I was trying to figure out how to deal with that, and uh, I came up with something that works pretty good, uh, and it's pretty simple, uh, and it's a variation of of you know selection modifications that I was taught to do by somebody on the internet. I have no idea who. Um, but what I ended up doing was just drawing, uh, you know, a line around the transition, making a making a selection here, oh, yeah. and then uh, you, Paulo needs to mute. I think somebody speaking Italian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. OK, uh, so what I came up with was then I modify that by contracting it. Whoops, sorry. Uh, contracting it by uh, 16 pixels, contract by 16 pixels, and then feather by 64. And that's um, in contrast to my normal uh, selection for most things is to expand by four and feather by 16. So this is the expanded and feathered selection. And then I just um, change the levels until, you know, it looks about the same. And then if I remove the selection, it's not too bad. Yeah, I mean, now that you know where the where it was, you can kind of see there's an artifact there. But uh, that's that's what I did on this image that eventually turned into this one. So, just wanted to share that little technique. Um, yep. Yeah, so that's it on that one. So that's uh, a Photoshop technique? Yeah, Photoshop. Done. Yeah, Photoshop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, sorry. 
Go ahead. No, I was just changing topics unless, but if you're still, are you done? Well, I was looking to see what else I had loaded up here. So um, oh, yeah. what was I trying to show here? This was the, the Orion mosaic. Um, and I don't remember what my point was on this one. So go ahead, hi. Just backing through um, the steps. I was going to, um, let's see, uh, share a, Bruce asked about an image, and so I had one that I did a few weeks ago. There's a, uh, let me just find the share button. Where is that again? Uh, present now. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a big problem with the image. The, the, the problem is that I did this, and I was really happy with it. Can you guys see the uh, the galaxy? Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I was really happy with this, and then I shared it with Francesco, and he processed it better than me. So I wasn't thrilled with that. But <laughs> uh, what are you going to do, right? Um, but I was happy with the image anyway. So and, and and my goal, but I don't know. I have this kind of, you know, I don't know, I, I, I can't get anything done when I'm all at home with this COVID thing. So, but my goal is Francesco shared his uh, processing techniques and I'm gonna try to copy him and see if I can get it to where it is. But even the way it, it currently is wasn't too bad. Um, so I, I guess what I liked about it was, you know, I thought M106 down there at the bottom is a pretty dim galaxy, I mean, small galaxy, but yet, my four inch scope, it worked, you know, there's plenty of detail, looks nice, and it's sort of a nice composition with those smaller red and red and blue star on top and the whatever galaxy that is there. Lots of little galaxies. Anyway, so like I say, I was happy with the uh, th the uh, image, and at this scale, it looks okay. You blow, if you zoom into it, it's on my uh, astro bin. If you zoom into it, you'll see some artifacts from the way I processed it, but. I can tell now that, uh, you know, maybe Francesco can share, but um, that it is possible to process it so it actually doesn't have those little artifacts. That's all. Very nice. Beautiful. I think it was a nice, uh, I liked the, this idea of doing the body processing, sharing the files, and then after that, sharing the, <clears throat> the, the actual projects. So apart from the three hours needed to upload the, the project to Google Drive, it was a very <laughs> nice experience. Yeah, I mean, actually, that's true that we buddy processed, I processed. Francesco had one that I, I processed of his, and he had, you know, and, and I sent him my files, and he processed mine, and we traded them and looked at each other's work. It was, it was a good experience, for sure. I, I do recommend that. Very nice. Hi. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I found the, the machinist information, and actually it's not Michael's, it's Nick's. His name is Nicholas. Uh, his number is 408-832-7606, and he's uh, on DiGiulio Avenue, 1059 DiGiulio Avenue in Santa Clara. So if anybody needs any machining, he's a, a very nice guy. Oh, uh, shoot me a note on that. Okay. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe just send an email to the group. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll put and it on that's that. Proof, and that's your proof that you told us, and you get your proof get in the future. <laughs> yeah, I'll get my commission. <laughs> uh, so, uh, who else would like to share some? Some stuff. I know Francesco has had some very nice images lately. Uh, let me let me see if I can uh, find how to share. Oh. Uh, present now in your screen. All right. Can you see? Yes. Okay. This is uh, my version of a uh, highs image. So the crop is slightly different, but uh, don't don't pay attention to that. The colors are different because I use the PCC 
and in general uh, the uh, I tried to limit uh, the hey, Francesco you can just present that one screen instead of presenting your whole desktop just FYI okay how do I do that it was one of the options on present present all try, or present a window all okay. right try uh, let me try again Okay, present. I only have the option of presenting the entire screen here. Okay, well, sorry. That's okay. And we're back. Okay, let me expand it to the whole screen so you only see that. Yeah. Is it still showing to you? Yes. yes. Okay. I'm never sure when it's a full screen. So anyway, this uh, the da highs data and uh, my processing. And um, there is a project that I'm currently working on, and it's uh, NGC 2903. I'll be taking two more hours tonight. But for now, I have this. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a smaller spiral galaxy in uh, in Leo. And it's, uh, of course, because of COVID, I'm imaging from the balcony, so Bortle 7. So it will take more time. Uh, after tonight, uh, hopefully, I will have 10 hours. And it should, it should be a little bit better, but not uh, an earth-shattering difference. Uh, I've been trying to use, uh, I don't know if you guys bought um, uh, Rogelio's book, the new one, the mm -hmm. Mastering Pix Insight. So I'm trying to use uh, some of his suggestions in my work workflow, but in the end, I, I see that one of the tools that uh, were most effective for me to integrate in my in my workflow was Arnet++. So thanks to Rob who prepared the uh, the plugin for P for Pixinsight, I can do it directly from the application instead of doing it from uh, with a command line tool. And uh, we also we did some experiments. We also found how to run it on macOS. Uh, without uh, even on Catalina without uh, problems but yeah there's still work to do there on uh, on Juan's part and I think that's since the last time uh, I saw all of you guys I probably also processed uh, this one this is uh, this is the third uh, the lesser known of the oh why the lesser known of the bright uh, nebulae in uh, in Auriga. So this is IC417. So lesser known than IC405 and IC410, the Flaming Star Nebula and the Tadpoles. But still, it's uh, I think the nickname for this one is the fly and spider. Mm -hmm. the, this being the spider and this one is supposed to be the fly. This is 10 hours. There's lots of noise because of the Bordel 7 sky. So I have, we have to do <clears throat> what we have to do in this moment. But I had uh, in the past uh, had better results from uh, these skies. I'm happy in particular about my, my monkey head from February. From the same, uh, same sky, it's uh, I think six hours and a half. But there's much less noise. Maybe I was luckier, and uh, there were better skies when I was when I collected this data. And the, the month before that, I collected the same uh, data for the same object that uh, Glenn also showed, which is uh, IC four four three, the the jellyfish nebula, and this is my version of it. Yeah, that's that's it. And right now, as you can see, in, can you see my pics inside? Yes. Yeah. Right now, I was uh, trying to find uh, the right uh, weight expression for uh, the 127 frames that I have so far collected about uh, NGC 2903. And uh, tonight, with with any luck, I will have 30 more. And uh, probably I will call it done because uh, after that, there's next uh, next day with uh, clear skies will there should there will be a pretty bright moon so it's uh, that's probably it for this month for me how about your contribution to astrobin oh yeah i don't think i can uh, we can really see it here but <clears throat> i had uh, 
uh, <clears throat> for a long time I've been uh, less than uh, excited about uh, the fact that Astrobin, even if you have a, a retina display or a 5K monitor, it shows uh, images at 72 dots per inch. And the, the most other hosting image hosting sites do much better than that. So they typically render a high resolution image and they scale it down so that your display, if it's capable of high DPI, renders a much better image. And I had to complain about this to Salvatore to no avail. So at some point I decided to to take the matter in matter in my hands and I first developed uh, an extension for Safari for one for Chrome and one for uh, um, Firefox that would replace the image with a high resolution counterpart on the fly on client side only. Hmm. And then I, at that point I sent it to Salvatore saying hey take a look at how much better your site could be. And he actually liked it and so he asked me if I could uh, take a look at the source code so that I could be more effective in doing that. It's still a client side uh, substitution of the image, but there are a number of hints that the server sends to the client, the, the web browser in this case, to do the substitution. So if you notice in the last uh, 10 days that the apparent quality of uh, the images shown in Astrobin in the images, what, what he calls the technical card, has improved, it's probably because uh, of uh, the, the code contribution that I sent him. 10 days ago. And uh, he, he reviewed it, he asked me for some modifications and ultimately accepted and uh, rolled it out uh, last, uh, yeah, not last weekend, but the previous one. Bravo. Thanks. Yeah, bravo, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that he has implemented it uh, in, in the code yet. Uh, you know, because I still see, uh, you know, if I if I'm not hovering my mouse cursor ah. over or my mouse pointer over the image in the technical card, um, yeah, I see it in the higher resolution. And then if I hover over it, I see it. It goes back to the default lower yes. resolution. So the reason for that is that uh, when you hover the mouse, Astrobin shows you the. Mm, the plate solved the version with the annotations. Okay. Even if you don't do it, it Astrobin still shows you a pre-prepared version that is supposed to have the overlays. And that pre-prepared version has low resolution, no matter what I can do. There's okay. no high resolution version of that image. So I cannot do the trick of, to substitute it. The no. only solution would be, so you can, um, if you have an ultimate subscription, you know that now that there's new level, um, and you do the advanced uh, plate solving, then it's actually an SVG overlay and uh, it, it retains the same quality of the image. But if you use the old style uh, astrometry.net uh, um, overlay, then uh, you should probably make some changes in the way the, the, the image is processed after it's returned from, uh, from astrometry.net. Hmm. So the people who are looking at it uh, don't don't have to have the ultimate, but if you have the ultimate, it yeah. translates to their their side. Yeah. Cool. So if you look at my images, mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, I'm have an ultimate trial subscription, and you should see that there's no no change in the resolution when you hover the mouse. The overlay comes in, but it doesn't change the the image resolution. Okay. I doubt that I can share. I mean, I think that if I share my screen, uh, it would still uh, uh, only a 72 DPI version of my screen would be rendered on uh, on yours. So it's probably pointless if I do it. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm taking a look. Anybody else bought, uh, bought Rogelio's book? Um, I did. I haven't had a chance to, to look at it too much. Um, so, okay, so I just, I brought up one of your, uh, I brought up your Pac-Man yeah. from a couple of years ago. And, yeah. um, and as the technical card came into, you know, it, as it, um, it filled, um, initially the image 
looked soft, but yes, after a couple of seconds, it, it filled in with the higher resolution image. So yeah, because it's it's loaded dynamically, so that uh, at first uh, there's a uh, if that's not the, the image that you wanted, if you are quick and uh, flip to another image or go back, you don't need to waste your bandwidth downloading the high resolution one. Ah, okay. Very and, nice. Uh, Salvatore was very keen on having that. He, he didn't want me to just replace uh, the image from from the start. He wanted first to render uh, a low resolution version and then replace it with the high one. Uh, okay. Yeah, Francesco, I, I bought Rogelio's book. Um, there were like two 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 parts to it. Uh, I started looking at the reference section because I thought it was pretty useful as a, kind of as a manual for a lot of the functions yep. in the book. Because uh, I don't think Pixar Insight has an official manual. Yeah, uh, right. Uh, I haven't. I mean, look at the other part. I guess it just has more general processing steps. Uh, but so far, it looks pretty well written. I know if you had yeah. any in it. I think I also when I bought the also the paperback version when uh, of course when it will be ready I think it's going to be a monumental tome because it's 400 pages plus the reference guide so <laughs> I got the book recently and I am thrilled with it yeah I'm a beginner at P Pix Insight after months I'm still a beginner but uh, boy, this is uh, so much better than the Inside Picks Insight book that I was suffering with. Uh, <laughs> uh, for one thing, he takes three separate passes at the at teaching you. The first one is uh, is for beginners, and he keeps things simple and uh, depends on the defaults and uh, pushes you right through it. And then he comes back in the second pass and goes into more detail. Uh, so you don't have to read all 800 pages to get going. Mm -hmm. I brought a picture. I'm working on a picture. Okay. Uh, I can, uh, I didn't, uh, when I went to find the latest version of it, I couldn't come up with it, um, but I, uh, we'll bring it up if I can. And this is this is like from two days ago. I've got a better one now, but uh, this story is the same. Let's see if this works. Can you see this picture? Um, it's starting to share. Yes, it's coming up. Yep. Ooh. Okay. Okay. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Hi uh, posted something uh, about this uh, comet atlas and i thought that sounds interesting i looked it up and i uh, then made a point of getting out to shoot it i don't have a telescope i'm using a nikon d5600 with a 300 millimeter lens uh, it's a crop sensor cam camera so it does have a it it's uh, not adequate for a comet but it's good enough um the field of view is three degrees by four and a half degrees. And I was processing this on a laptop, which was extremely slow and painful. Uh, so I got the idea, well, when I'm all done with this, I'm going to crop this way down. So uh, I said, uh, why not crop it before wasting a lot of time on the computer? So I used the crop process and I went through and cropped 63 images um, by a factor of about 12. And that speeded up everything by a factor of 12. So uh, that was just an amazing improvement. Uh, and since then, just in the last week, I uh, got a hand-me-down desktop computer and I've been working on that and speeding it up. Uh, so I am gonna master this. Uh, this picture is uh, was uh, done in, uh, first in Pix Insight through the uh, weighted batch processing and a couple of more processes after that, and then I took it to Photoshop and uh, and and made this image. The this is aligned on the stars, and 
so the what you see there for the comet is uh, two hours of movement of the comet uh, all blurred together. Uh, there's another picture, if I can figure out how to bring it up. I have no idea what to do here. Let me push escape and see if I can know. Um, if I close that, um, now there's nothing. I think you minimized it. It's I did cool. minimize it. I'm trying to get the other picture. Um, let's see. Any ideas? I'm going to stop presenting and start again. Okay, sure. Okay, now I start again. And I'm going to present a window. And I'm going to get a new chance. Can you see that? No. Nope. Do you see a picture? No, only you. Okay. Share an application window. Well, that's too bad. I'm. Uh, this is the first time I have ever used this uh, Meet app, and uh, so I am. I don't know how to change windows. Do you want to try sharing your whole screen instead of a window? Then. Um, okay, that's a good idea. I yeah. do you know how to switch to that? You um, stop sharing and say yeah, pr stop presenting and say present whole screen. Okay, we'll do that. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to switch to the picture that I want. Do you see a picture? Nope. Mm. Not yet. You don't you, see a picture. You're not sharing your screen yet. Uh, we see you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Here we go. Yes. Do you see a picture? Yes, yep, we do. We see the comet. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this, I use the uh, PIX Insight process comet alignment uh, to align on the comet. And you can see now the stars are streaks. Uh, you, you take your images that are aligned on the stars and use those as input to comet alignment. And um, you click on the first image and the first image in the sequence time-wise and uh, use your mouse to tell the process exactly where the center of the head of the comet is. Then you do that again with the last image in the time sequence and the comet align process uses the uh, times recorded in each image uh, to uh, interpolate where uh, between the uh, position of the first image and the position of the last image, it uses that to interpolate to figure out where that image, uh, how much it should be shifted. And so this is what the what a comet actually looks like without the blur. Unfortunately, the stars are blurred. This is a double challenge. Uh, first, you get the two images, then the challenge is to eliminate all of the stars. Mm -hmm. And I'm working on that. And I spent the day in uh, working on uh, the new computer. The um, 
so maybe next month i i maybe even tomorrow but i know we only do this once a month <laughs> so, so uh, uh when i get this i'll when i finally finish this processing uh, i'll i'll show it with round stars and the true image of the comet uh this was uh you know we're locked down now and i can't go to a dark site i where I live, uh, in order to see the uh, northern part of the sky, to see north at all, I have to go out to the driveway. I can see three street lights from my mm -hmm. driveway. And I live in Menlo Park. The sky is, of course, awful. But what are you going to do? I said it would be better just to, uh, if nothing else for practice, just to go through the motions of taking a picture even in a lousy sky and maybe if you get enough images uh, maybe you'll get a decent image uh, so i had all together about 90 minutes of exposures and uh, it's it's a chance to learn uh, the how to use the rig and it's a chance to learn how to use fix insight so it's been a, a good experience and um, i'll tell you more about it next month Fantastic. Well done. Steve, I, I assume you know that there's um, this technique, uh, there's a chapter on it uh, on uh, Rohil in Rohilia's book. Uh, yes, I've read the chapter and I've read uh, two or three other descriptions of how to do this. Um, it's just a, a matter of of um, actually mastering it. Uh, this picture here is is uh, one of my early attempts to eliminate the stars. Um, yep. And I have used, uh, in addition to having already cropped this down uh, to speed things up, I also can make a region of interest that in just includes a small part of this around the comet and a few of these star streaks. Uh, yep. And I can process this with my new a hand-me-down desktop computer, I can process one of those in about 10 seconds through the comet alignment process. So it's, um, I'm kind of at the point of experimenting with it until I get it right. And this picture is from two days ago. Sorry, I don't have a better one. Uh, one of the challenges of having a new desktop computer is uh, sometimes I'm not on the right, I don't have the images on the right computer. <laughs> so uh, this, I'm, I'm using my laptop for this. I have, I've made a point of installing almost new, no software on the new uh, desktop so that I won't be competing uh, all the time. And I have just installed today uh, solid state drive, which about, so I'm up to about uh, two and a half times the speed of my laptop, and I've got 32 gigabytes of RAM coming on Thursday. So I will soon be uh, speeding along. And I, I love the new book, but it's still a challenge for a beginner to, to yep. uh, work through this. And by the way, if anybody is using this technique, you you definitely wanted to use at least the PixInsight 1883 because the previous version had a bug in the comment registration and uh, I submitted a fix for this bug and was incorporated in 1883. Well, I am using the latest version, <laughs> but perfect. Uh, that, uh, just a hey, matter uh, now of working through it. That's really fantastic, Steve. Thanks. Um, I'm very happy to see that. I was wondering uh, if anybody knows any details about when this new comet, Comet Swan, might be visible in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Comet Atlas uh, Y4 2019, I think it is, uh, coming apart at the seams. and. I'm not sure how long we'll be seeing it. It's not going to meet up to the uh, the predictions that it might be visible at daytime, I think, uh, this month. Um, 
but we have a new comet that was discovered recently, Comet Swan. Uh, the uh, Swan Comet, uh, I think uh, Wayne mentioned it in the in the discussion group recently, and I oh, and I should uh, thank Wayne for giving the instructions on how to add a comet to uh, Stellarium, which I use. I did that. I had no lot, no problem with that doing Atlas, but when I went to Swan, uh, it wasn't in the database yet. So that was about a week ago, probably time to check again. Uh, and at that time, I did look on the internet to see where it was. And at that time, it was only visible, I think, from the Southern Hemisphere, but it is coming north fast. Okay. Another opportunity for a nice comment. I'm, I'm actually excited. All I need are clear skies. <laughs> uh, we'll see. Um, anybody else have anything they wanted to share? So speaking of Solarium, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, I could, I could, I could share some images of some things I've been trying out. Um, let's see if this present thing works. Um, let's see here. You guys see this? All right, so I've been um, trying out night vision, night vision tech. Cool. Um, so this is a, uh, it's it's a it's called a Mod Three uh, C mount, and uh, it's made made by AB Night Vision, and uh, it's right here in the middle, uh, between there's a there's a Sony camera here on one end, and then uh, there's a lens on the other end, and uh, for those who aren't familiar with night vision, what it does is um, it takes the incoming photons and then it multiplies it by, I think, something like a factor of like 80,000 or uh, a big, a big number. Um, so then when you look on the, on the rear end through the ocular, uh, a lot of things that would be invisible to the naked eye are now, uh, sufficiently amplified to, um, uh, to actually quite bright. Um, there's a bit of scintillation, meaning like you'll see you'll see it kind of like sparkle. Uh, but you know, just from the parking area where I live, um, I'm sure I can easily see uh, like mag six or seven. Um, and you know, this is this is from with like even with like city lights or you know street lights all around. Um, I mean, it helps to block a little bit of the glare by using a. You can make your own kind of like dew shield. Um, and uh, you can certainly connect it with uh, with like a lens or something. I can zoom in here a little bit. But I think in the, in the front of this is um, a C mount, which uh, is not something we use in astronomy, but you can convert from the C threads to uh, like a two inch um, adapter and put it into the focuser of, an, of a telescope. Or you can, uh, there's other adapters to like, uh, here I have it directly connected to a Nikon lens. Um, so it's, uh, the, the lens I think is 180 millimeter focal length. It's an F 2.8. Uh, so it's basically like a 64 millimeter refractor um, operating at F 2.8. Uh, so with night vision, you, you know, because it's, it's basically a real time view. Uh, so there's no like, um, long exposure of any kind. So you want to be able to gather as much light as possible. So having like a fast focal ratio um, is, is a big advantage. You know, so like F, you know, F4 or something or under, you can really start to see nebula. You can, you know, in, in, a, in the bright suburbs, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll show a photo in a moment, uh, but I was able to get the uh, Rosette Nebula to show up pretty well. Uh, it's quite large in the sky, actually. It's really amazing uh, looking at it through, um, even through at one X without a lens. Um, it looks massive. Like I think, it, I think it feels like it's larger than the full moon. Hmm. Um, pretty easy to find it just by kind of scanning it around. And remember, you're getting kind of almost like a real time view. There's no almost no lag because you know, it's something that the military would use 
you know, when they're when they're out at night, um, covertly, it's uh, it's it's it's. I think it has about a forty degree apparent field of view, so it's a little bit less than most eyepieces. Um, so it's like looking through a plossel or less than a plossel. Um, and uh, I have it here mounted on a just on a generic uh, tripod with a dwarf star mount. Um, so it's pretty light. And then, you know, it has a hundred millimeter rings kind of gripping the lens. And then on the back side is the um, eyepiece. But now in this case, I have my camera threaded onto it. Um, there's some adapters where you can hook the lens up to the backside. Uh, but there's also, a lot of people use like smartphones uh, to take photos and those work amazingly well. Uh, you can um, get like a standard uh, digiscoping smartphone adapter to just try to grip the, the head of the, the eyepiece and then, and then just position your phone correctly. And, and there's, there's some apps out there that will, that will, that will let you um, uh, like do a slightly longer exposure on your phone, you know, like up to like a second. I think in this case I was I was shooting exposures at about a second. Um, let me see here. Yeah, so here's the Rosette Nebula. Um, I think there's a lot better photos of this um, on the night vision forums on cloudy nights. But this this was done, uh, yeah, in like just right here in where I live in Saratoga and um, city. You know, there's uh, the the complex I live in has lights um, in all directions. Uh, so I'm, I'm impressed that I'm able to see it even. Um, oh, and, I, and, and another thing is I have an H, HA filter in the imaging train. Uh, I think it's a seven nanometer HA filter. Uh, and that's required to, to bring this out. Without it, uh, you would definitely lose this object to the, to the bright skies. Um, so for and then this is probably, let's see if there's information here. Okay, so it was point, or sorry, it was two seconds, F5.6, uh, 70 millimeter uh, focal length on my Sony camera and ISO 3200. Um, I shrunk it down uh, to a smaller size just so I could, for easier sharing. Um, but yeah, that's that's with my Sony F five point six lens. I'm sure like smartphones can shoot a little bit faster focal ratio than that. So that's this two second exposure might end up being more like like a quarter second or something. Um, but yeah, I just I just got this recently, so I'm hoping I'd be able to try it out some more. Um, and uh, you know, once we're you know once once everything opens up, you can try out some more challenging objects. I've seen, I looked through it at, I look, looked at globulars before and they, those look really amazing. Uh, globulars uh, resolve really well, almost like photographs. Um, I've tried, uh, let's see, galaxies are a little bit harder because they, they tend to, um, they don't benefit as much from the filters. Uh, I think maybe in darker skies, galaxies might look really nice, like M51 or M101, like maybe that spiral structure. Uh, but I think in brighter skies, you can you can see a lot of uh, different emission nebula uh, with with the right HA filters and and then with uh, and just for like general stargazing, uh, you can put on a long pass filter. I think six six hundred eighty five nanometers is what's recommended. So that basically cuts out like the vast majority of the city lights and then. You know, gives you everything kind of in the near infrared, um, which it still is quite a lot. You can see, like, you know, probably all the open clusters, Messier globulars will probably come out really well. Um, so I have a couple other things to show. This is NGC two four four two, and uh, I think it's it might be a uh, a southern hemisphere object. I have to check. Uh, but I, I didn't capture this myself. I got this from telescope.live and it's, um, I was, I attended a AIC last year and they were one of the booths there and they were giving away some credits for people who would sign up. I think as I think being in the beta program, I got a pretty generous amount of credits. And then once I gave them some feedback about how the, how I felt the tool 
work. They gave me even more credits. So I ended up getting like a good five or six images out of it. And then I've been processing that while we're in quarantine. Um, but yeah, this might've been done with the, um, I'm thinking it was a Richie Kratian with, maybe that's why there's these um, diffraction patterns. Um, but yeah, they have telescopes in some pretty dark skies um, in like Chile and elsewhere, high altitude. So, you, so I think um, the pricing is quite expensive in that it's something like, probably comes out to something like a dollar a minute for their cheapest scopes and then like $3 a minute for some of the higher end stuff. So you're looking at a, you know, a couple hundred dollars for um, like an hour of, of exposure. But since you're in really dark skies, you can get pretty good quality. But yeah, if you participate in the beta program, you'll, you'll get, you know, four or five images out of it. Um, and then let's see, I have one more. Oh, this is the, um, the dark doodad nebula. Uh, so I think one of the things I wanted to try in darker skies were like dark nebulas. So those are almost impossible in bright skies. Um, this one came out decently. I think my uh, processing skills are still relatively beginner. Um, I think I had some help from high, he gave me a bunch of steps on how to process, um, which I think I might have one of those results here. Ah, yes, this was M8182, I think, um, from some help from high. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna be working on processing uh, a bit more in the coming weeks and figuring out if I can bring out a little bit more depth to, to this dark nebula. Um, instead of just making it like really dark, maybe there's some things I can do to give it a little bit of a shape. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, I think that's, yeah, that's everything I had. Any, any questions or anybody else here has tried out night vision or has ever looked through one? Um, you know, I was down at Pinnacles a couple of years ago and um, somebody did have one set up and it was pretty, pretty cool. Um, uh, I work with a guy who uses it a lot, uh, but not for astronomy. He just likes to, uh, he's kind of like a paramilitary type. Um, but he, he does have some night vision stuff and, and, uh, he knows what I do for my hobby and, and he was recommending that I check it out and I, I haven't had a chance to do anything lately with it, but, um, he was saying that they have some full color night vision that actually is pretty impressive. Um, is that monochromatic or I should try yeah, to it's monochromatic. They have, um, you can get them, you can get like green phosphor or white phosphor. So I think mine's white, which actually is more of a kind of like a dull blue. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the, I think the white ones are a little bit pricier. They're also a little more popular, um, especially for astronomy. I think looking at a green one, maybe that can kind of saturate your cones. Um, of that color after a little while. Mm -hmm. um, but I've, uh, I had the chance to try out one of these a uh, few months back and um, you can definitely put, uh, I created a color image out of one and by putting um, RGB filters somewhere in the imaging path, like I guess before you get to the night vision device um, and then you convert your images to monochrome you know, you shoot RGB, convert to monochrome, and then you, you do your standard integration, um, you know, uh, RGB combination, and, and, and it actually works. Um, and I think the advantage of doing it this way is uh, you can get away with shorter exposures, um, you know, like maybe if, you, if you're not guiding or you're not tracking even, uh, you might be able to get away with that and still get out an astro image. Uh, you can probably do narrow band with really short exposures, um, provided your camera is sensitive enough. Um, like, like I did the rosette there with a fraction of a second. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think I might have to set up some kind of fil manual filter wheel or something. So you don't have to break apart the imaging train every time you're doing that. Um, but it's possible like with the RGB filters, I, I don't know if there's a way to view it in real time. Night vision, that would be an, I have no, no idea how that would work. Um, but maybe someone can invent that. Hmm. Well, there's something yeah. similar that we've been doing with uh, live stacking where you can get a color image from narrow band. Um, hmm. I, can, 
I have some examples here actually of the rosette as well, just because that's what was up. Um, but as part of the whole COVID uh, thing, you know, I've been working with uh, Jerry, who's our president now of SJAA, um, on, you know, getting ready to do virtual star parties. Um, so we are figuring out how, you know, we could, the, the imaging side of the house could could help by showing images while the visual observers host the star parties the way they, they normally do. So uh, that's what we've been doing. And, and Bruce and I have both done some live stacking in uh, monochrome. And then if you have one shot color, you can do it in sharp cap. And then I figured out a way with some software called Astro Toaster, not Astro Tortilla, but Astro Toaster, how to do it uh, using Deep Sky Stacker Live and uh, uh, narrowband filters. So if I can grab the, so are you it, done, Joe? Like, can I grab the? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. You can you can present. So would it then be shooting through each filter, um, like in a kind of a round robin style, and then? Yeah. So uh, I'll show you the example here. So this color image here of the rosette was uh, SGP, uh, just like you would normally use it, except it was doing 30 second exposures and in a, you know, a round robin versus finished an entire event. So it was, you know, doing HA, S2, O3 in a repeating pattern. And then that's what this, this Astro uh, toaster software does is it keeps track of all that and and does uh, three separate stacks using uh, DSS uh, Live, and then it uh, assembles them uh, all automatically. So this this color image here was you know the longer you do it, the better it looks. Uh, but this was after about seven minutes from you know slew to the to this color image. Um, so that was pretty exciting to be able to do that that quickly. And then what you see below it here is just a, a sharp cap a live stack of, a, of an HA filter. And that, that was 15 second exposures. Um, so that just a couple minutes after slewing to the, to the object, then able to show that to, to people on a screen. So, um, that's a way that we can use our traditional imaging rigs to show things rapidly as if we had, you know, a video camera or something instead. Of course, you could use, you could put the camera in, in video mode, but, um, you know, these are uh, ways of using the narrowband filters and the whole, the whole thing, so. Um, uh so if you wanted to use flats with that, would you be subtracting the flats as you do the live stack for each thing in SharpCap or using the flats somehow in uh, DSS or how, how would that work? Yeah, I believe uh, I didn't, these are uncalibrated, um, but I know in SharpCap you can, you can have darks and flats. Um, I have to look at Astro Toaster again, but I'm pretty sure it probably does have that capability, but um, I don't know that it's really needed just to get something up on the screen, but um, I can look for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then uh, something else sort of on the same topic, um, switch windows here. Um, you know, we've been watching what some of the other astronomy groups have been doing and the, the uh, Royal Astronomical, whatever it is, Canada, which I forget what the, how you say the acronym, but um, they, they did a whole bunch of stuff using Stellarium. And so we're going to try to um, take advantage of, of Stellarium. And so one of the things that I've, that I did as a, excuse to get out of the house uh, was uh, I went to, um, can you see the Stellarium screen? Yes. 
Okay, so this, I went to both RCDO and uh, Mendoza, and I'm brightening this up here. Um, so now here we have, uh, ah, get this window to move. So here's uh, RCDO as a, as a landscape in Stellarium, so you can see where your sight lines are and whatnot. And then uh, since I was already down there, and by the way, this place was jumping, the parking lot was full, and there were people hiking and biking and doing all the normal stuff, but they just had uh, a lot of instructions from the, from the Open Space Authority tech about staying six feet apart and all of that stuff. Um, and similarly, I went to uh, I went to Mendoza, and it was the same thing. That was that people were were doing all kinds of stuff at Mendoza. Uh, so again, if I brighten this up, oh, it's already bright. Okay, so here's what it looks like from Mendoza. So we'll have these available for the people that run star parties to put in their stellariums, and I can share these with whoever. And we also have. Uh, I had done earlier, uh, you know, little Uvis, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, Hoagie, Hoagie Park. Um, you know, here's the the sidewalk where they normally do the the star parties. There, you can see how old this is because it's my old Z there. But um, so we have these backgrounds that are landscapes that people can put in in Stellarium. Very cool. And, you know, it, it definitely will help with uh, your sight lines. I, I'm actually wondering if I can in integrate these into uh, the Sky X for my scope limits. Um, I know there are ways to, to add images and to use it to do your uh, limits, but I, I don't know how. So maybe we can figure that out. Yeah, I haven't l looked at that. I mean, obviously, I, you know, I've got the the instructions in the Stellarium manual now. The, the chapter I wrote on uh, getting images into Stellarium uh, for for DSOs. Um, so that's doable, definitely in Stellarium. Yeah, I haven't played with the the SkyX. Okay. Hmm. Uh, anybody else? Hmm. Uh, Question is anyone, um, and I don't know if this was mentioned earlier, is anyone do, able to do any observing from anywhere during this time other than say their own, their own driveway, their own yard? Or remote observing. I like normally that. image from from here in Union City, and it's a Bortle seven or eight or whatever. Um, but I just have a rule of thumb that I do uh, ten hours per filter, and then it's mostly narrow band, um, and then it's okay. But yeah, that's a lot of time, but that's what it takes. Uh, what's been going up at Casa de Rob lately? Rob. Sorry, my mic was on mute. Not too much. I, I have an image I've been working on, but it's on my other computer and I, was, I wasn't ready. Uh, mainly I've been doing protein folding simulations for, for uh, <laughs> Rosetta at home and, uh, and folding at home. Um, and as some of you know, Francesco and I have been messing around with the Starnet stuff and I don't know. It, there are ways to make it work on the latest version of Fix Insight and the latest version of Mac OS, but I guess the ball has been in Juan's court for a while. So uh, supposedly when he releases the next version of Fix Insight, it should start working again, but we'll just have to find out. Okay. Hmm. Well, I sure hope so. It's a great tool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, the main computer that I use, I have some of that stuff turned off, the, the security stuff. So I didn't, I never noticed that it was a problem. And then yeah. somebody on Cloudy Nights was complaining. And then, you know, but, you know, like I said, I, it, you know, we figured out that if you, if you build 
the pick inside binary a certain way, it should it should work. But you know, I guess Juan has been busy doing something and he hasn't released it. So theoretically, when he releases the dash six, it, we hope we'll start working again. And in any case, Bruce, if you are in a pinch and you need to use it, there are ways to make it work. Oh yeah, that, I, that wouldn't be recommended uh, to the general public, but among us, <laughs> yes, our util disable. Uh, we'll we'll get uh, what's the name of the uh, the uh, security protocol that that prevents you from using things sometimes. Oh, uh, yeah. it's it's not that bad. You just if need you, to remove uh, Juan's signature from the binary, which yeah. is a simple command, and uh, macOS will compl complains the first time. After that, it will let you do it. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, but if you have a if you have a hacker nearby that comes and uh, replaces your picks inside binary with the most malicious code, you will never know. <laughs> yes. Well, hopefully not. Um, that reminds me, though, you you, uh, you redid red screen so that it would work with. Uh, yeah, with, uh, same. Yeah. It's the same, same, same stuff. Same thing. Okay, very cool. Um, okay. What's going? Yeah, there there was one thing that that I forgot to mention that might fit in with uh, the uh, photo multiplier stuff that Joe was doing, which is. Uh, I found this app, which is it's actually a pretty awful app uh, for the iPhone called uh, Milky Milky Cam, I think, and it's essentially like D Deep Sky Stacker Live. So it it takes somewhat longish images and then aligns them, I guess, internally and then stacks them, so you sort of get a real time oh. image out of it. But the, the user interface is terrible, and it's uh, I'm not even sure I know how to use it. And I managed to make an image of Orion that's nothing to write home about, but, um, you know, and I, I'm fairly certain that the Android phones are way ahead on this kind of night photography anyway, so it may not be anything really useful, but if you have an iPhone, it's something to check out. It's free app, so I guess we got to lose. <laughs> it's called Milky Cam, you said? Yeah. I mean, I, I have an image on my... Yeah, Milky Cam, and he's got another one that's similar called uh, Spiral Cam, which is meant to be used at the eyepiece versus being used, you know, just the back of the phone camera pointed at the sky. So, uh, yeah, check it out. But they're they're a little painful, but <laughs> it's at least something to try. Well, maybe somebody will develop something a little better. Uh, Nope, you can't. Hmm. I found it. Milky Cam astrophotography. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know if I can successfully share my screen, but I can show you the image that I took. It's really not that great. Hmm. Uh, you know what? Because of my window manager stuff, I'm not sure I can. I can do this. Yeah. Maybe next time. Yeah. Yeah. PJ, looks like you're out at your observatory or something, huh? Uh, that's correct. <laughs> what do yeah. you? But that sounded like a curse word. <laughs> yeah, wasn't me. I'm trying to do, try to get the QH Weiss uh, thing to work with uh, the Sky X. Uh -huh. Yes, and uh, frankly, I get confused easy out here. Uh, regarding using the the Ascom driver for it. Uh, well, um, come on. Damn, it must be bad out there, PJ. <laughs> hey, I got a question while we're waiting is, uh, okay, skies aren't too bad tonight. What should I image? 
Uh, yeah, I guess that's my question right now. I was going to try and shoot M101, I think. Because I've wanted to do it. I haven't done it with the six inch yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's behind behind a tree for me. Yes. Well, I got plenty of trees, but um, M101 is good. I have a pretty good southern horizon, pretty good eastern horizon. I'm pretty obscured from the north, uh, north northwest to the uh, north northeast, which was kind of deliberate on my part because it blocks off the big uh, town in these parts, 20 miles away. So, uh, uh, pretty much, I have pretty close to an all sky view and I'm on a ridge and uh, but I'm sheltered the so wind's not ever a problem here snow can be <laughs> but I think we're through with that so I'm out here with my uh, Samsung phone as a hotspot tether I don't have internet out here let's see where the hell everybody go Oh, there we are. We're there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to sort these things out. Right now I'm trying to do a plate solve. And uh, for some reason, it doesn't like me. I don't know. I can do this. I don't need exposure, do I? I have to wait till 320 for my target, but using a 200 millimeter lens, I'm going to be trying this uh, butterfly nebula and the crescent in one frame. Oh, that's um, nice. So we'll see how that how that goes. Um, but again, yeah, I'll be looking for 10 hours per filter. So this will be the first of several nights. <sighs> Huh. Yeah. Where the heck did it go? I don't know, man. Da, 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 da. Speaking of the the camera lens, um Paulo had pointed out to me this new product. Uh let me jump back in here again. We had, both of us had previously built uh, sort of do-it-yourself uh, focusers for uh, camera lenses, um, but somebody now has a commercial product that uh, is a better mousetrap. Um, so this is, you know, if you've got like a, a Canon lens and a, a ZWO camera, you may be familiar with the adapter that ZWO makes that uh, you know, has pieces you can add or subtract to account for the filter wheel or no, and put a put a two inch filter in. But these guys have added uh, the electronics so that using the you know an ASCOM driver and a USB cable, you can focus. Whoops, you can focus the lens uh, using uh, uh, you know the the motor in the lens that was intended for that. So it's kind of cool. Um, and so I, I gave these, these guys are in Russia and they're brand new, but I gave it a shot. And uh, where's my email window here? Uh, very first uh, first light got a good got a good V curve, and it seems to work really well. So I'm pleased. Um, so they have uh, uh, this Astro Mechanics. They have uh, both for crop sensor and now full frame. Uh, with Canon lenses, and then they have adapters for various different cameras. So just FYI, so far I'm really pleased. Uh, they also, yeah. they also make a, uh, a light sensor uh, that I was going to buy, and they wrote me back today and said, uh, 
we've got a new version coming out. So why don't you wait a couple months and we'll tell you when the new version is here. So I'm probably going to check that out as well. Somebody okay. had a question? Do you know the modification that they are planning to the that sensor? No, he just said it was a new. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. A new version. Makes you wonder what was wrong with the first one. But <laughs> <laughs> exactly my fault. Yeah. But as you know, it's just a, an Adreno uh, inside. And uh, I think it's just got two, two active components. Uh, the sensor, well, and counting the display three, I guess, but it, it's pretty simple. But um, the price is is reasonable to where you know with the packaging and everything. It, it, yeah. 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 Oh, oh, almost dropped my water glass there. Okay. Where did you that, Glenn? Hmm. Where did you, uh, how did you find that? Did you get it in Astronomy Technology Today or? Paulo found it. Uh, uh, no, searching, searching for uh, Canon uh, focusing. Hmm. On, on, on the net. Very interesting. Hmm. And does that, that reads that in Mags per arc second, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. They have a, a bit of collateral on the on the website. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I saw that they have also the adapter for the filter, so you can use the the sixteen hundred plus. The filter will. Hmm. Oh, the focuser? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm using it with the filter wheel. Uh, but Bruce and I have determined that's going to be part of tonight's uh, imaging is uh, it looked like uh, I had some coma uh, and I observed that when it came to focus, it was... Uh, downstream sort of to the left of the infinity mark on the camera. So that probably is an indication that the spacing isn't perfect. So I added a 3D printed uh, spacer and I think it's going to put the put the focus back on the infinity mark. We'll see here in a minute. And, um, check it out. So I added about 1.6 millimeters. Hello. Uh, that that uh, extension that you made for my top it really uh, did the trick. And uh, that is that material that you made that out of ASA or? Uh, yes, it is ASA. Okay. Uh, That's a sort of ABS. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's smoother than the stuff that uh, the carbon fiber stuff and less porous, right? Is, uh, is it stronger? I don't know, honestly, Com uh, the, in terms of strong uh, uh, compared to the, the material, the filament that uh, uh, he is using. I think that, uh, Glenn, you are using uh, is a nylon, no? Yeah, it's nylon with uh charged charged with uh, carbon fiber carbon fiber yeah hmm. okay. i have some uh uh other material with carbon fiber in it too that i never used much i don't recall what the other material is though <clears throat> hey paulo do you want to show that mount you made for my guide scope uh the mount that I, I made for your, yes, I, I don't have. I don't have. You have. <laughs> no, no. I mean, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's your point? <laughs> uh, 
I don't have. I'm I'm quite stuck now because uh, I, I I cannot show anything on on the on the PC because my, both my two PC I don't know if they're because they are uh, Windows Seven or whatever they were not connecting to the Meet hmm. and uh, I have to run on the phone and so sorry for the for the the mess before with uh, mute and this and the other because. I simply download the, the, the app on the phone and uh, connect with that. But uh, the other two uh, laptops uh, that I have, uh, they were continuing to run and run and run, getting ready, and uh, nothing happened. If you think it's a Windows 7 problem, uh, you can now upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10 for free. Um, yeah. And if I, I have, just go ahead. Sorry, uh, if I interrupt you. Uh, uh, talking about and me down uh, uh, PC, the the two laptop that I am using are two Sony, top of the line, but ten years ago, so uh, they are not able to be upgraded because the the um, uh, the video. Uh, GPU are not uh, supported. Mm. So I have to completely upgrade the machine. There I mean, are, uh, away. there are, um, it wouldn't work for the laptop screen, but there are uh, USB um, video cards. I don't think that I can upgrade win on Windows 10 using a USB window card. That hmm. could be, yeah, I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. Sorry, I have to run to... I have to change the filament, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, most of your printing, Glenn, when you're 3D printing, you don't have to babysit much much at all, right? It just does its thing. When it works. <laughs> okay. When it when it goes crazy, if your part comes loose from the from the base or something else catastrophic happens, then yeah. But basically hmm. you have to abort at that point and start over usually. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, it, it's a great uh, kind of like astrophotography. It's a great patience teacher, right? I mean, okay. yeah, you can get a prototype part, but you might have to wait three hours or six hours or seven hours or whatever. Do you uh, do a rough draft first? That's kind of yeah, like. Um, yeah, well, I mean, if I was better at the the CAD and the materials, uh, knowledge, right? You could probably nail it in one go, but that's why I'm kind of sticking to, you know, one printer set up for one kind of material kind of thing, but yeah. But I mean, uh, you can print very fast and you can print slower and higher quality. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So for the, in the ASA <laughs> fine threads, we've been printing at, at like 0 0.08 uh, millimeter layers, whereas uh, quick and dirty would be like uh, 0.2 millimeters or something, or 0.3. Okay. Um, what do they call it? The the warm head or the hot hot end? Uh, do those wear out? Are there the parts? Nozzles, you, uh, so. Yeah, you uh, the nozzles get clogged, and if you're using a filament with stuff in it, like carbon fiber or bits of metal or wood or something, then you might need a harder a nozzle made out of a harder material. Um, so uh, steel or even sapphire instead of uh, brass. Um, but yeah, you just change the nozzle. Um, they're not that expensive. Okay. Um, 
yeah i mean it's a whole it's a whole process to learn all the ins and outs of it and stuff lots of youtube out there on 3d printing yeah i'm changing the the filament in this very moment it's blue yeah it's blue Oh, you're printing the, for COVID, you're printing the... Yeah, that's the, yeah. the, the, the no. bottom uh, uh, of the face shield. Yeah. Bruce <laughs> uses those at work. I've been seeing a lot of those at work, a lot of that type of thing. Okay. Yeah, pretty much there, so let's go some other place. I'm printing 28 at a time. Are you sending any of them to uh, Kaiser Permanente? Yes, Pat, not directly, but through uh, Maker Nexus, that is a, a, a group that is, uh, let's say, collecting that. And now we are printing only the, the bottom part because uh, finally they put together an injection molding. So the top part, they are injection producing with injection molding and they're producing thousand a day. And so we need a lot of uh, lower part because that lower part is too complicated to injection molding fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, so need to be uh, printed. And it's going 24 hour, uh, one, up, one plate after the other. I'm with Rob. I'm using, I'm doing folding at home as my uh, contribution. So oh. I have all the all the computers in the house and the shed and the telescope are all folding proteins. Tell us something about that. Not not really astronomy related, but I am interested. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty painless. It uh, makes your fans run, and I had to had to adjust the number of of CPU slots for my various fanless computers to not overheat and stuff. But yeah, it's been it's been pretty smooth. Yeah, I, I went off and bought uh, three of kind of last year's high end GPUs. Mm -hmm. and put them in a couple of computers and the, the folding at home project has a bunch of GPU, GPUs, yeah. COVID-19 and those, those things really tear through the work units. I mean, I went from like a million points to 22 million points in like two weeks. So it's, it's been kind of satisfying. I don't know if it's doing anything. Uh, and then, you know, there's this Berkeley distributed computing project that grew out of the SETI at home. Uh -huh. And they have uh, a sub project called Rosetta, which is uh, similar to the folding at home. And so that one, for whatever reason, is CPU only. So I've got you know, a bunch of old computers just churning on those. But it's, you know, it's pretty easy to set up. It doesn't take too much work. It's just, you know, the video card stuff is a little fiddly. But, um, hmm. it's, it's not, you know, clear what is happening, right? Because they have these giant projects that they divvy up into a million little pieces. And then, you know, it probably takes them two or three weeks or something to collect all the work. They and, said that uh, they have more, uh, it's more than all of the top 500 oh, yeah. uh, supercomputers added together, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah they're talking about exaflop level yeah. computing. Yeah. And in I, fact, I've run out of work several times. That, yeah, so I have there's too. so many people doing it, which is great. So. I hope the researchers are taking advantage of it. Yeah. So you inspired me to look at my score here. So mine's 5,173,957. Yeah. Well, you got to get some GPUs. <laughs> I have one. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, the, the, some of the, you know, like NVIDIA 1070, even 2060, they're not that expensive anymore. So, you know, actually the, the real problem is the electricity, you know, I have yeah, solar, the, so the yeah. peak time, the electricity is, is pretty expensive. So I've actually stopped running midday just to, you know, cause it's, it's probably cost me like six, $7 a day, I think, <laughs> all these computers running. So you cut back a little bit. Cool. Yeah. I have a 1060 Ti. I don't know how yeah. much that would do, but. No, that's, that's, you know, I think that can finish, 
uh, typical working it in like four hours, three hours. So it's, it's probably worth hmm. it. Okay. Check it out. Glenn, you were working on a project with uh, all sky cameras, meteors. What's up with that? Um, so two, two different things. So all sky cameras and the meteor tracking. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I have one camera, uh, that does meteor tracking, uh, all the time. So it's just pointed at a fixed location in the sky. Uh, and you can see it on the web. Uh, I think it's cams 27, I think is my station number. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I actually don't do much with it. It just, uh, there's another guy that runs the network and he logs into my computer and does things and keeps it all running. And I just, you know, my job is just to keep the power on pretty much. Um, but I had, you know, all of their, their designs for everything are based on CCD cameras that are no longer manufactured, um, and hard to find parts and everything. Um, so I was bugging them to look at, uh, you know, modern CMOS cameras and USB connections and stuff. And so there was uh, some talk about that, and I was offering my uh, All Sky camera as one that they said they were interested in. The particular, it's a ASI 178. They were interested in, uh, but then we kind of stopped. The email stopped flowing, so I'm not sure what what happened with that. Uh, I had a uh, I had a active USB cable up to the roof and, and a, a, a project box. Uh, and apparently it, it, after two years, it leaked. And so uh, the camera was down for a while. So I haven't reconnected with them after the camera's been back in service. Um, but I can, I can bring up my AllSky camera if you, if you <laughs> want to see that. Uh, Got a clear sky now? Uh, I should. Let's, we'll find out in a second here. Let me get it going and then I'll share it. The RDP into a computer out in the shed. Hmm. Just manually adjusting the gain here for some reason. Well, I can see the street light. <laughs> <laughs> I can see Almost people. There. Yeah, there's some clouds. Yeah. Okay, present now. A window. Share. So you can see a palm tree here, and this is a street light. Mm -hmm. But you can see some stars and some clouds. Do you have cloud detection built into your observatory at all? Or? I do. And I just actually got that uh, going again today. Let me see. The, the cover is still on the, partially on the scope. Um, uh, that would be this window. But I think the cover's off enough. Yeah. Let me switch windows here. Stop presenting. Yeah, so this is actually, uh, I picked up the tip from, from PJ, is to use an IR camera, essentially an IR temperature 
pointed at the sky. Um, and I got a little module called a, whoops, did I, I just did the same damn screen again, sorry. Uh, stop presenting. So it's a little, a little uh, 10 degree uh, camera in an IR. Um, let me make sure I click on the right thing this time. Oh, to scroll. Where is it? There it is. Anyway, it's a little module that that you know speaks USB and has its own web server, and uh, it has a uh, uh, both a, an IR and a ambient uh, temperature sensor. So um, I this top part of text here is just their their example web form, and it's showing you here the the two temperatures, and I. Uh, added some JavaScript to do this uh, plot. So the the green is the, the sky temperature. And um, you know I think it's it's probably just still pointing at the at the scope cover right now. But you know no clouds would be minus 10, minus 20 type of temperature. Um, so yeah. So that's what I look at to see if I'm, if the reason that PhD2 is unhappy is because there's clouds, you know, I can look at the all sky camera or I can look at this cloud monitor. But yeah, I can run out there and take the cover off and see if the temperature drops. Uh, so when you're running at night, um, does it alert you if it looks like rain or? Yeah, it doesn't really have anything to do with precipitation, but, um, and I haven't taken it any further in terms of alerting me, but uh, one thing it doesn't detect is fog. So apparently fog is different than clouds in the way it reacts in the, in the IR. Um, and I did some research on how airports and stuff detect fog and it's a little more complicated. It's using uh, lasers and backscatter and actually bought some parts to make the, because they're very expensive, these uh, commercial fog detectors, but I never uh, finished that project. One of my 999 uh, unfinished <laughs> astro imaging projects. Uh, but yeah, you need to point a certain nanometer of laser at a certain angle, uh, you know, and, and have the receiver at the opposite angle. And so you're trying to get the, the back scatter off the f particles of fog. Um, yeah, because it can be it can be completely cloudy and and it still shows the temperature of the sky as being you know minus ten or minus twenty. Mm -hmm. That's too bad. Uh, what about a, a, a what's it called hygrometer? Um, yeah, I have a, a five in one uh, weather station. Uh, and that's another project is, you know, somebody had written an ASCOM driver and, and it's kind of the long way around. The ASCOM driver reads Weather Underground and you send your your data to Weather Underground and they hook up that way. Um, but uh, Weather Underground, like I guess all the weather apps have been purchased by IBM uh, and stopped being free. Um, so, uh, that guy dropped support for it and it stopped working when they changed the, the API mm -hmm. and I've, I, I think I could hack it, but, um, I'm just st stuck on the, basically I haven't done a lot of ASCOM programming. So that's in, in C sharp, which I'm also not familiar with, but I think I could get that working again and, or, uh, I've figured out how to uh, 
read my weather station via RF. And so I bought a little uh, software controlled radio, software defined radio, I think is the term, uh, software defined receiver. And uh, I've found a program online where you can, it, it understands my weather station and can, can get, get the data. So then again, I would have to write uh, an ASCOM driver to pull that into SGP or something. Or I could just go buy a, <laughs> a cloud sensor. <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll, uh, That's too uh, easy. Commercial yeah. cloud sensor be able to detect fog better than what you're doing now? I don't know. I haven't messed with that. Hmm. Uh, I know they're good at clouds and rain. I don't know about fog. It seems like the only, you know, when I did the research, the only fog detectors were these very expensive $12,000 things for runways. The laser back scatter things. Yeah, the laser back scatter, yeah. Okay. Uh, what are they called? Boltwood, the, the other, the commercially available cloud and rain sensors, I think. That's a real popular one because it works with ACP, yeah. Uh, doesn't help with the the uh, marine layer unfortunately though no mm. don't think so well, so i was feeling guilty because i think pa paulo wasn't able to show what he made on his printer for me for my uh guide scope so i took I br i've got some pictures if you want to see them sure yeah. yeah go for it well you <clears throat> Do that. I'm going to run out and take my cover off my scope. Okay. So the problem that I had is um, it was a 60 millimeter uh, guide scope, and it uh, the mount that it came with has these <laughs> rings that have sc centering screws on them with nylon tips on them. Mm -hmm. So not the most stable thing in the world. So I, I looked for quite a while online and couldn't find anything other than nylon tip screws that were going to secure the secure the guide scope. So I asked Paulo if he could throw something together because I knew he had a 3D printer. So this is an Orion 60-millimeter uh, uh, guide scope. And um, as you can, I don't know if I can... If it'll let me, I guess it won't. It, it, it isn't really an active app when you bring it up like this, is it? It should be. And I can't. I, it, well, you need to interact with it. On my screen? Well, it helps if you have multiple monitors, but. Yeah. You interact with it in the app itself versus in the version of the app that's being shared inside Meet. Yeah. Okay. I guess I, I guess I could close it and change the picture and show you a different view. Or just Sounds share your share your screen instead of the app window. Okay. And then we get to look at two pictures of everybody. <laughs> That'll be fun. There we go. Why is it not? Oh, and just do my whole window, entire screen, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm suggesting, yeah. Okay. Okay, what are you guys seeing? <laughs> Pictures of it. Drag that out of the way. Yeah, there you go. Um, but still, okay. I have another way. <laughs> Hang on a second. That's, there you go. That should work right there. There you go. That's a side view. Mm -hmm. It's definitely industrial strength. And this, this is on a Vixen mount. And that's another side view. 
That's a ZWO camera that I use for guiding. That works really well. In fact, the whole configuration definitely improved the tracking. Yeah, so. the pieces, the pieces are joined together with uh, with screw, and so uh, are quite precise because are all printed flat. Yeah. There is no request for support or other things. Yeah, well, it, it definitely made an improvement in my guiding, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a little over-dimensioned, but... It's all right. I like industrial strength. That works fine for me. Generally, <laughs> <laughs> engineered is a good thing. Yeah, so thanks again, Paolo. Working, work you're well. Welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. That, that's uh, a good way to use the toys. You know. Uh, yeah. yeah. How how long did it take you to put uh, get that printed out? Uh, a few hours. A few hours because uh, the the dovetails uh, for the for the victim, I think that was three or four hour. And the two vertical support other three or four hour. So totally, I, I think ten, eight to ten hour. But you know, it's not uh, it's not a big deal. To you launch the the print, you go to the bed, and in the morning you find the piece. Almost like the Easter Bunny had visited, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so. What about the design phase? No, design, design uh, I don't know, a couple of hours, two, three hours, using OpenSCAD. We, me and Glenn, we are using OpenSCAD. That is quite a, a, a card uh, that is, mm, let's say, strange because uh, the interface uh, is not uh, a graphical interface, but is a programming interface. So you write actually a sort of pseudo C code that you have primitives uh, and so let's say you call routines that are doing cubes, circles, uh, uh, cylinders, uh, and you have operation of those uh, differences, uh, uh, union, uh, you have uh, loop with four and these kind of things, variables, uh, and it is very uh, convenient when you design uh, mechanical pieces because you define variables uh, with the dimension and uh, all your uh, design become parametric. So if you want another of those uh, support that instead of 60 millimeters has uh, 65 millimeters, for me is a two minutes uh, job to produce a new design. Because or an 80 millimeter. You could do an 80 millimeter as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever. You can yeah. completely, oh, the, oh, completely the, scalable. Of course, it depends to you, like uh, every time you write a piece of code. If you start to embed your code with constant and, uh, and, uh, and absolute numbers instead of using variables and parameters, uh, uh, that, that's the problem. But Yeah. What, what is the material you used on this? Again, is a, a ASA called is a ASA. A, a, an ABS. Is it, quite is like ABS, but uh, it do not uh, uh, degrade with uh, ultraviolets, so can be ah, left okay. outside without problem. Hmm. Said that the ABS uh, uh, have some degradation, especially in color uh, and the surface, but not in strength. As, as far as I know. Where the bolts thread into the mount, uh, how did how did you do that? Was, you put an insert in there to capture yes, the screw? There are, there are inserts, uh, um, let's say, all, uh, hot inserted. You insert that with a, a soldering iron. Hmm. 
in order to fuse the the plastic around uh, so they become embedded so you have brass insert where you screw the, the screw very cool yeah yeah solved a big problem so if somebody has similar problem uh, let me know as soon as i finish uh, to print this covid stamp stuff uh, i will be available <laughs> for a nominal fee <laughs> yeah and nominal when, fee. Is, when is your uh precise parts website uh, functionality going to be available? <laughs> How did I know that was coming? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Elate would be my in, in, still in my dream, but uh, boy, I always uh, dreamed uh, to own Elate for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's lots of people uh, strapping big lasers to their 3d printer to turn them into cutters and yeah but actually actually i i consider the uh the fact to build a cmp mill mm -hmm. in order to have a, a possibility you put a, a motor like a dremel sort right. of and uh, you have a an X, Y, uh, Z uh, structure that is quite easy with uh, three pepping motor to, to produce. And you have software like uh, slicer software that we use for the 3D printing uh, for milling instead. Uh, and that is easy to mill a solid plastic or a, a block of aluminum. It's not a... Not so much complicated and that can produce a, not not things that you can produce like late typical a thread of course but uh, you, you can produce a lot of different forms yeah i've seen uh there's a guy named andy c that's his handle i guess on uh Cloudy Nights that uh, was talking about how he was milling. Uh, Mark Scrivener, actually, I believe he can do that. And he also has uh, the ability to uh, anodize. Oh. He has a lathe as well. Uh -huh. That would all come in handy. <laughs> he has a, a, a woodworking section of his shop and a metalworking section of his shop. Well, an astronomy, a self-respecting astronomy club should own a, a machine shop. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. We're going to find something to do with that club money yet, huh? There you, there you go. There you go. <laughs> That's a good okay, idea. So, Jerry, if you stop sharing for a second. Sure. Um, so, Bruce, I ran out and took the cover off, uh, and I'll show you that in a second. So the temperature dropped immediately on the sky. But I wanted to show, here's here's the uh, dust cover lens cap, whatever, that I printed that's this TPU. flexible material. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. What's that made out of? It's called TPU. It's mm. another type of plastic. So. That's very nice. Yeah. So. Okay, I got to get one of those things now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when, when, Glenn, are, when are you going to get the time to do anything with it? <laughs> right. Well, that's the other issue. And yeah, just Glenn, anyway, you. anyway, I ordered that I should receive in two days uh, uh, a new Bowden cable because I want to to try the TPU as well. But. Okay. Uh, uh, I, Due to the fact that um, my 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 printer is running twenty four seven uh, with uh, now with PLA but before with uh, PET G, this high temperature and my Bowden uh, is I think is degrading. So I both yeah I didn't think it was going to work because you know you you do the load filament and then it normally starts extruding right away. 
but nothing was happening and I just kept I just kept feeding it in there so I think it was just compressing 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 until it got yeah. to a certain certain uh, you know it filled up essentially um, at a certain compression and started working and then it printed fine from there so okay yeah and that's the reason why I ordered the Capricorn uh, because they are uh, more precise uh, and so that we should be less uh, wiggling inside the bottom. But anyway, okay. Okay. off topic, off topic. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, so Bruce, see here is where I took the, the cover, scope cover off and it dropped almost 10 degrees. So, you know, any, any negative number is going to be a, an indication of no clouds and then it'll jump jump back up clouds are warmer than i the, saw that and i was going to say gee it looks like it cleared up so yeah hmm. any other hobbies <laughs> 3d printing uh, any, anybody crocheting or knitting or crocheting. Oh, my. covers or my wife is constantly suggesting that I take up crocheting instead of astrophotography. <laughs> I drop on it yet. Why ever would she feel that way? I don't know. I think my mother-in-law might have suggested it once. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. She's not welcome there anymore. Huh? Yeah. Uh, she's pretty much locked up at home anyway. So <laughs> the way things are right now. I don't know. But no, I love her. Great. About that well. well, what do you think? I think this went very well. Yep. Yeah. Really I'm pleased with it. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks for thanks, thanks for everybody hosting. participating. I still have to to understand why my boat machine are not working, but uh, yeah. I would figure out. Next, next time we're going to get Francesco to start giving classes on how he does all his wonderful processing. Actually, Francesco. Oh, I think he just stuck that. There he Did is. he just hang up? <laughs> oh, no, no. He's still here. He's up here. <laughs> Francesco, what do you think? We'd be doing it yeah, the workshop, uh, uh, but online. Uh, we can uh, we can certainly try. It seemed that. When people were sharing uh, pictures, uh, I think that the quality was good. I mean, it, I didn't feel like uh, we needed more resolution uh, or the refresh rate was bad. So mm -hmm. I don't. Technically, I think it can be done. I think so too. Yeah, we'll, we'll put that on our agenda. We just need, yeah, just need to put it on uh, on the calendar. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. All right. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this was very good. I, uh, I got my PhD thing going. Got about 1.1 arc second RMS at the moment. And I'm going to be shooting M101. I got rid of that beep thing. I have a love hate relationship, mostly hate, with the guy X. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be taking pictures. What was beeping on the Sky X, Paul? Huh? Four letter words. I have no idea. Okay. I was taking. I was trying to do a, an image link. Uh huh. And I didn't get anywhere with that, so I quit that and went back to the to the uh, sharp cap for the video. At least it has a live view that's actually visible. I might be able to help you with image link. Yes, I'm sure anybody could help me with image link. <laughs> I did do the T point things and got that all to work. Okay. But that was with a different telescope. I just might break down and do it with a six in. Because mm -hmm. they're different, you know, they got different cone errors and all that good stuff. Okay. Yeah. So. But I think I'll. Since we're basically in the moon, new moon period now, I, I got it so I can take pictures. So I'm going to do that for a while. All righty. Yes. Just go for it. Stay warm. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got some. Uh, 
I got a fair amount of clothes up. It isn't that. It, it's warming up now, so it's only in the 40s and high 30s. It really doesn't yeah. get much below that unless it's unusual. Uh-huh. I noticed they've been up here with six degrees, uh, which was a lot of fun seeing as how I was running the cannon totally manually, including the exposures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so all right well we we look forward to seeing your m101 on astro bin in a couple of days yeah yeah that could be the case and uh, i'll probably be shipping in a i don't know what i'm going to do i need a i need a different camera for the rasa that's all there is to it i think the 268 it might be a good one it doesn't seem to uh have the the haloing but uh, the D sixty eight, the two sixty eight C, or oh, or, or the, the, uh, the equivalent made by all uh, CWO. Yeah, about twenty five hundred dollars. Huh? They go for around two grand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm saving so much money with gas being up here. Let me tell you, I've used uh, about three eighths of a tank of gas in five weeks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah with all this uh lack of driving out there it really should work uh wonders on the transparency i would think yeah well that it's, too that too it's gonna oh, work well, wonders on the gas prices too <laughs> i oh, think yeah a little different up here than in san jose uh, nobody's really taken this terribly serious in Tuolumne County because there's only been two confirmed cases of COVID period in the entire time of the epidemic. And they all got, and they came from a cruise ship. So go figure. <laughs> well, I was, I was going to say something about you not wearing a mask. So <laughs> can I get this from deer? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 15 acres I'm uh, rattling around on. Well, I'm sorry you guys can't get out and do some dark sky photography, but I'll try and make up for that for you guys. Okay. All right, we're counting on you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you. For sure. All right. Thank you. All Good right. seeing you. See you next time. Good yeah, to see you. I'm going right. to get out of here myself. All right, guys. Take it easy. Take care. Good meeting. Yep. Good, Good night, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yeah, I can turn off my phone.